SpaceX is about to drop Starship into the sea. The race between SpaceX and NASA to get their monster rockets into space tipped in the government's favor, with the SLS finally thundering off the launch pad, putting more pressure on Elon Musk's company to get Starship off the ground. However, there are still several milestones before Starship will be ready for an orbital launch. SpaceX broke new ground by simultaneously igniting 14 Raptor engines at once in the past week. The static fire testing will likely continue to spool up from here, with SpaceX adding more and more engines into the mix. The drama will continue to grow as will the spectacle, and watching Booster 7 ignite all 33 of its Raptors for the first time will be quite an event. There's no firm timetable for any of this, but we should expect brisk movement. As SpaceX tends to move fast and the company is targeting to launch Booster 7 and Ship 24 in the next month. That fateful flight will originate from Starbase, Texas, just under two minutes after liftoff at 171 seconds, the Super Heavy Booster will separate from the ship. The booster stage will then perform a partial return and land in the Gulf of Mexico, or return to Starbase and be caught by the launch tower. Meanwhile, the Starship Orbital Stage will ignite its Raptor engines at T plus 3 minutes and 56 seconds for the first time and continue into orbit, heading east over the Gulf of Mexico and following a track passing between South Florida and Cuba to never be above populated land while still ascending towards orbit. Cutoff of the Raptor engines is expected about 8 minutes and 41 seconds into the mission. Once orbital velocity is reached at roughly 28,000 kilometers per hour and a soft controlled ocean landing 62 miles or 100 kilometers from the northernmost island of Hawaii, Kauai. Musk pointed out on Twitter that this will be three quarters of the way around Earth, much further than the 6.2 mile or 10 kilometer up and down suborbital hops observers of the program have grown accustomed to, and that deorbit over the Pacific Ocean is a necessary precaution to minimize the risks of breakup on re-entry for this first attempt. The flight will end around 90 minutes after liftoff at 5,420 seconds. It's worth noting that Starship will still splash down at the end of the mission. It'll be out in the water with no platform to land on and nothing to catch it. And why is that? Why is SpaceX dropping Starship S24 into the water instead of catching it with Mechazilla? Well, there are some good reasons for this decision. Allow me to explain. The first and foremost reason is certainly related to human safety. If you're wondering, by the way, why the orbital starship doesn't try to land in Starbase, Texas as it has done before, that's because the orbital flight test landing won't be coming in from an almost straight up and down trajectory like the previous prototype test flights have. Its flight path is also much more complicated than the booster. The starship will be coming in sideways and it'll have all of its orbital speed along with it when it re-enters the atmosphere. To play it the safest, it needs to re-enter the atmosphere somewhere over the ocean in case something goes wrong. If there is some sort of failure with this experimental spacecraft that relies on experimental systems like its brand new thermal protection system, then we might find ourselves in the same position. We have seen a disaster happen in the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster in 2003 where spacecraft chunks rained down all across parts of the US, so no, we don't want any of that to happen again. And the location where they're going to try to put this orbital starship prototype down after its flight is clearly well thought out. It's right in the middle of the Pacific, where the re-entry portion of the flight will happen over the ocean with such a trajectory that will ensure that any debris will end up in the ocean if something goes wrong. And the splashdown site will be a safe distance away, but still very close to the Hawaiian island of Kauai. This will presumably allow SpaceX to recover the Starship and gain potentially priceless information from studying the crispy remains, all while keeping everyone safe and not having to deal with international hurdles because Hawaii is in fact part of the United States. Additionally, this is a SpaceX test vehicle. SpaceX does this radical thing that other space companies don't really do called rapid prototyping. At one time, a single product prototype cost more to produce than the final product. 
the value provided, even if it was only an approximation of the production design, came from having a physical representation that could be handled, tested, and evaluated. However, if it was destroyed in the process of the design needing to be revised, the cost of time and money to create another one was generally prohibitive. Today, rapid prototyping has made the fabrication of physical models cost-effective as well as fast, and consequently, its use has become a practical step in product design. The ability to to repeatedly produce and revise prototypes speeds up overall design timelines. As SpaceX engineers learn quickly and make adjustments, they can deliver a production-ready design with confidence, having gone through the necessary iterations. Elon Musk relies on these iterations and the concept of failing fast in order to succeed sooner. He's using this approach to develop a rocket that can complete an orbital launch and land safely with the ultimate goal of building a reusable rocket. Shortly after the first SpaceX Starship prototype broke apart during a pressurization test in November of 2019, the company introduced the second. Musk named it SN1, or Serial Number 1, with the expectation that others would follow. By building, testing, and flying vehicles as quickly as possible, SpaceX engineers learn what works and what doesn't, then rapidly move on to the next version. At SpaceX, as Elon Musk says, Failure is a compulsory step. While gearing up S-24 for Starship's maiden orbital flight, Ship-25 is installing its engines, heading to another phase of testing. Out in the ring yard, we spotted some sections of S-27, 28, 29, and even S-30. It's obvious that SpaceX has attempted to construct an inexpensive and mass-producible vehicle in the first place. And that's why they'd rather lose the hardware in a failure than waste time figuring out all the failure modes, which is basically the long way. And so, dropping Ship 24 in the water does not lessen the significance of this mission. As SpaceX said, the company intends to collect as much data as possible during flight to quantify entry dynamics and better understand what the vehicle experiences in a flight regime that is extremely difficult to accurately predict or replicate computationally. This data will anchor any changes in vehicle design or con ops, or concept of operations, after the first flight and build better models for us to use in our internal simulations. And that's about all for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. Otherwise, as always, this is Kevin with Great SpaceX, and my team and I will see you next time.